Good morning, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Associates of the American Foreign Service Worldwide, I warmly welcome you to our annual Christmas celebration around the world. This is one of the most beautiful seasons of the year, no matter from which part of the world you are from. It is a season full of joy, happiness, festivities, as traditions and family get together, building memories that will last forever. Today, we are hoping to add a few more wonderful memories as we are enlightened about the special holiday traditions of five countries, uh, the Czech Republic, the Philippines, Mexico, the Slovak Republic, and the Holy Land. Each one has its own special way of celebrating this holiday, as well as the turn of the, of the year. Now, without any further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce to you our AFSW President, Lara Center. Uh, and good morning from Washington, DC. We hope we have friends from around the globe joining us today. I am the president of the Associates of the American Foreign Service Worldwide. We are a nonprofit organization that supports the American foreign affairs community from employees to family members and retirees. Today, uh, we are excited to present the Christmas celebrations around the world. I know that Sheila, our program chair, has put together a wonderful program. I hope you enjoy it and thank you. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Joanna Ramosopoulos Cohen, which is our AFSW Public Relations and Family Funds um, Fundraising uh, Chair and today's moderator. Welcome, everybody. It is very nice to have you here. It's going to be a very special event. Uh, I would like to let you know that uh, your audio and video are disabled. Uh, you can, we cannot see you or hear you, and uh, uh, you are going to remain uh, with uh, muted audio and the video disabled for the whole program. We will have a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. Uh, please place your question by clicking chat at the bottom of your screen and place the question in the chat box on the right. Also, I want to thank everybody for being here and all uh, the AFSW technical support in the background, especially the AFSW webmaster, Nicole Spiridakis, the AFSW social chair, Patricia Linderman, and the AFSW office manager, pa Barbara Ryu. The sequence of the presentation on the customs and traditions for the holiday season is the Czech Republic, the Philippines, Mexico, the Slovak Republic, and the Holy Land. Sila, you're welcome to introduce our first uh, speaker, the ambassador from the Czech Republic. Thank you so much. It's my great pleasure to introduce His Excellency Heineg Komenich, ambassador to the Czech Republic to the United States. Before his appointment since 2013, Ambassador Komanesh worked as the director of the Foreign Affairs Department in the office of the President of the Czech Republic. His diplomatic career has spent more than two decades since he joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Czech Republic, specifically his Department of Middle East and Africa in 1995. He worked in different positions as the director of the North Africa and Middle East Department the Director General for Asia, Africa, and America, and the Deputy Foreign Minister of two different, in two different periods. He served as Ambassador of the Czech Republic to Australia, India, and the United Nations in New York. Before joining the Foreign Service, the Ambassador studied English and um, Arabic language studies at, Char at, at Charles University in Prague, Czech Republic, and, mo and modern history of the Middle East in Hebrew in Arabic language studies at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, Israel. He enjoys cooking and cuisine, collecting the hardest sauces in the planet, and writing for various magazines and newspapers. His Excellency Heine Komanesh is also the ambassador of the Czech Republic in Jamaica, in Antigua, in, Barba, in Barbuda. Ambassador? Well. Oh, hello, hello, good morning. Uh, uh, thanks to Joanna, Lara, and you, Sheila, for inviting me. 
uh, as uh, you have introduced me, uh, I do not sound like a person who knows anything about Christmas because probably I am just working, but that's not true. So for uh, all the members of the Association of the American Serv uh, Foreign Service Worldwide uh, and the guests, uh, it's today my pleasure to introduce a little bit of the Czech Christmas traditions. As, as you mentioned, uh, there, there are five participants today. And if you look at them, three of them are staunchly Catholic. Then you have Czechs and Slovaks, which are a little bit Catholic, Slovaks a little bit more than the Czechs. Uh, and I will try to explain why before we will offer you the two uh, very good videos about our family, uh, family and Christmas traditions, because they will be much more descriptive than I can be. And usually one picture is better than 20 talks of, the, uh, of any ambassador. So what, what happened was that uh, Christmas was every time the most important celebration of the Czechs uh, during the year. We, uh, compared to Americans, we celebrate it uh, on uh, December 24th, which we, uh, in our unpronounceable language, call Štědrý den, in translation, uh, the generous day. Why is the day generous? Because that's the day when you celebrate with being given the gifts. It's a big thing, especially for Czech children. In any Czech family, you simply want to skip the dinner, which you are not allowed to do, because after the dinner, one of the members of the family has an important job to disappear without uh, children noticing and ring the bell. Uh, with the bell, the every time invisible baby Jesus comes uh, and gives the gifts under the decorated Christmas tree in a typical European uh, and Central European Christmas tradition. The dinner, which you are not allowed to skip and most of the children hate anyway, usually, usually consists of the fish soup, which is really good, but so specific that we try to skip it for any other evening uh, during the year. <laughs> and then comes uh, the typical Czech fi fish of carp, usually because the fish meat is not much of the meat. So to make it a little bit more of the Czech meat, we make the carp in the form of the classic Viennese schnitzel with the potato salad. And after that, the ring comes. And after the ring, the children run under the Christmas tree to find uh, their gifts. Uh, all that was happening traditionally for hundreds of years in the Czech lands with one uh, special thing which I have to mention. For more than 50 years, we were a communist state. And Christmas was technically uh, a, a Catholic, uh, Catholic festivity. As the communism didn't like Catholics and were fiercely competing with them, proclaiming the state atheist, that they had a big problem what to do with Christmas. Uh, for some years, they even tried to cancel the Christmas or to replace it with some tradition which would be named a little bit different or the same name, different, different features. It was never successful an attempt. Every time people wanted their Christmas back because at the end, the only thing which communists managed was to a little bit diminish the religious character of uh, that celebration in the Czech Republic. Uh, in uh, basically giving more uh, more focus on the family family values and family traditions, uh, they never succeeded completely because even the family traditions are so deeply rooted in our Christian culture that it was simply too much for the communists to fight against. 
So with, with that explanation, why we might be a little bit different uh, in the religious character of Christmas uh, after 50 years living with our communists and finally getting rid of them. Uh, and uh, you might notice that it is not as much Catholic celebration as it might be with, with the other presenters today. But I will not talk more because uh, I should do the same what the adults do during the Christmas to disappear somehow uh, and to ring the bell. And with the bell, I can see Honza Boska, our culture officer, who will play the gifts. Two videos uh, from the Czech Republic, one which uh, highlights uh, uh, the festivities around the country, and the second one, which will give you a perfect introduction to the Czech family and Christmas customs during this festive holiday. Merry Christmas uh, and stay healthy. Greeting you, uh, the Czech ambassador to the United States. Bye bye. Let me take you on a journey to a land far, far away where in winter everything is magic. I promise you want to stay. Welcome to Christmas Prague Guide Special. In today's episode, we're going to show you all the traditions that we do during Christmas time and especially during Christmas Eve. Our most important day of Christmas is the evening of 24th of December when the whole family gathers, just like at this table, I'm here by myself, and we eat the traditional meals, we light up candles, uh, we got, you know, decoration and so on. So let me explain to you one by one what we got here. This would be the Christmas cake, or as we call it, Vánočka. Not enough sugar, why don't you have some cukroví, the Christmas sweets. These are actually bought from a store, but the best ones are always from your grandma. We light up the candles on the Christmas wreath, one by one each week before Christmas. And of course, we decorate our homes with poinsettia and mistletoe underneath, which you should kiss. And now for the main course. Uh, before the main course, we actually have a fish soup. Unfortunately, we didn't get it. Under the plate with the main course, we put money and a fish scale for good wealth on the upcoming year. Most people for Christmas Eve will actually get a carp to eat. Uh, they'll buy it the day before on the street live, put it in their bathtub, and then kill it on the Christmas Eve and then prepare it. 
We don't know how to prepare it. This was the only one we could get. No, we're not gonna get that. Instead of that, we're gonna have a schnitzel with potato salad. Always potato salad. That's important. It's time to eat. So, dobro chuť. Very good. And after you're done with the meal, it's... Did you hear that? That's the sign to go to the Christmas tree. So let's go! Just so you know, the presents, the gifts under the Christmas tree in Czech Republic are brought by baby Jesus. We call him Ježíšek. And also, in the room, we usually leave the window open so we can tell the kids, oh, he must have just gone away. So finally, it's time to open the presents. I'm so excited. What do we got here? Oh, that has my name on it. It's for me. Oh. Well, it's in the company envelope. <gasps> An issue of Prague Visitor with me on the cover page signed from Hansa for me. Oh man, that's so kind of you. Thank you. That's really nice. For some other traditions, we actually had to go outside because they won't let us uh, uh, use open fire in our offices. But for this one, we almost forgot you should cut the apple, or we do that. And if there's a star in the middle, sort of. Then we also make these little uh, nut boats and we put these um, candles on them. We burn those too. We'll light those too. Okay, last one. But we also um a olovo. I don't know what's the translation, but it looks like this. And then we try to guess the future from that. I've never done it myself, to be honest. And then, we also do that when going to the Christmas tree, we light up prskavky. Woo! These are the cause of uh, most fires in the Czech homes during Christmas. So be very careful with them if you want to try them at your place, especially if you have a carpet. And of course, when you light these, you're supposed to sing the Czech carols. Nesem vám noviny poslouchejte. So veselé Vánoce, everyone. Merry Christmas. I would almost forget the most important thing at my dinner uh, for Christmas Eve is a birthday cake because it's my birthday. So uh, happy birthday to me, I guess. What did you wish? Well, thank you very much for this great presentation. And we would like to thank both uh, His Excellency, the Ambassador of the Czech Republic, as well as uh, Jan Voska for helping with the presentation today. Now we are going to continue with the presentation from uh, the Embassy of the Republic of the Philippines. I would like to introduce His Excellency Jose Manuel Romualdez, uh, who was appointed Ambassador of the Republic of the Philippines to the United States of America in July 2017 by President Rodrigo Roa Duerte. He formally assumed office after he presented his credentials to US President Trump in November of that year. This is his first stint in government service, which he finds extremely rewarding and fulfilling. Ambassador Romualdez has extensive experience as a media professional and business executive. He writes columns for the Philippine Star, a major broad seat in the Philippines. His columns have a wide readership, both in the Philippines and abroad. Darrell Artes is the second secretary and consul in the, in, the, in the public diplomacy section of the Philippines Embassy in the United States. Her portfolio includes cultural diplomacy, public affairs, press relations management, and Filipino community engagement. She is also the administrator of Centro Rizal, Washington, D.C., of the Philippine Cultural Center. Like most Filipinos, she gets into the Christmas holiday spirit early. Thank you both, and we are looking forward to having your presentation. Thank you very much, Joanna. Um, thank you very much for that kind introduction, and good morning to all viewers and guests. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce a video presentation prepared by the Philippine Embassy in the United States. This three-part video begins with a Christmas holiday message from our ambassador, His Excellency Jose Manuel Romualdez, to be followed by a short segment on Filipino Christmas traditions. The final portion is dedicated to sharing basic information about the Philippines and the best ways and places to visit when it is safe to do so. On behalf of Ambassador Romualdez, I wish to thank the associates of the American Foreign Service worldwide for this opportunity to tell you more about our country and our people 
as we say in Filipino, thank you, maraming salamat po. And here is the video on Filipino Christmas. Please enjoy. Good morning to all of you and to all our viewers online. Allow me first to greet everyone in advance. A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. I also wish to thank the associates of the American Foreign Service Worldwide for this opportunity to join you in today's virtual Christmas program. Christmas in the Philippines starts early. It is the most festive season of the year that every Filipino is always looking forward to. As early as September, you can already see the colorful lights displayed in public places such as parks, malls, and even neighborhoods along with the playing of popular holiday songs on different radio stations and programs. Christmas costumes and traditions include the nine days of Simbanga Bay or early dawn mass. And on Christmas Eve, Filipino families come together to enjoy heritage cuisines and delicacies throughout the Philippine archipelago and beyond. But more than that, or more than the lights, food and music, Christmas for Filipinos is all about faith, friends and family, and about being grateful and giving back. This is one aspect of our culture that we bring with us together or wherever we are in the world. Here in the United States, we always try to bring these traditions to our engagements with the community especially with the Filipino Americans and overseas Filipinos who miss celebrating it at home with their loved ones. And if you happen to pass by the Philippine Embassy along Massachusetts Avenue, you will see the beautiful Christmas paroles or lanterns. They symbolize the Filipino Christmas spirit and represent hope, goodwill, and resilience as we come together as a nation to celebrate the Unitide season in the new norm. I hope that through the video presentation and brief exchange we will be having today, we will be able to share with you on how we celebrate this important and joyous occasion with each and every one of you, the Filipino way. May this season bring joy, camaraderie, and fellowship as we look forward to a better, safer, and more prosperous new year ahead. Thank you very much, and please enjoy the rest of the program. Mass at 4 a.m. for nine straight days. Singing carols in the galas, trying to. Enjoying festive treat. And bibinka. Picking out paroles, which have been on sale since September. Yep, that's the Philippines for you. Christmas from September to January, pretty much. You know the season starts once you hear Jose Marie chant songs everywhere. It seems like more than any other holiday, Filipinos just absolutely love Christmas. Not just because of the vibrant lights, the get together with loved ones, the amazing food that is served, the conversations and laughs along the way, or even the generous gifts. All of these play their part in creating amazing every single year. Above all, Filipinos just love to give love. Maligayan Pasco, second and how do you get there? Located in Southeast Asia, the Philippines is an archipelago of 7,107 islands, bounded by the Pacific Ocean on the east, Hong Kong in the north, and Indonesia in the south. The country's coastline measures 36,289 kilometers, giving the destination miles and miles of unspoiled white sand beaches. 
For those who do not know the Philippines, it is an Asian country with a passionate flair for life that is more Latin than Asian. This is due to the fact that the culture is a unique blend of diverse influences in its history, namely Malay, Chinese, Spanish, and American. The Philippines is truly a place where East meets West. The Filipinos, as the people are called, are known for their hospitality. They enjoy entertaining guests and go out of their way to make visitors feel at home. The Philippines is a country rich in tourism resources. The islands that comprise the Philippines are grouped into Northern Philippines, Central Philippines, and Southern Philippines. Philippine Airlines has direct flights daily from several North American cities to Manila, the primary international gateway of the country. From Manila, the Philippine Airlines connect to a vast domestic network. The capital is the jump off point to other parts of the country. Several international airlines also fly from North America to other Philippine gateways like Clark, Cebu, and Davao via other Asian cities. What are the top tourist destinations of the Philippines? Manila, the premier city and capital of the Philippines, is a good place to start. It has been the seat of government since the Spaniards colonized the islands in the 16th century. A tour of the walled city of Intramuros allows the visitor a glimpse into Manila's historical past. Manila's dining options are a treat for people who live for good food and innovative cuisine. The city's five-star hotels all offer not only luxurious accommodations, but also a choice of dining possibilities and music entertainment. The entertainment city of Manila is another fun place to chill out in the evenings. Manila, as the fun capital, is a popular meetings and sent convention and exhibition destination as well. Would you believe that a bottle of beer costs less than a dollar and a good massage less than 10 US dollars in the Philippines? That definitely is value for money. Let us now travel from north to south of the country to locate the popular tourism spots outside Manila. Up at northern Philippines, we find three other popular destinations, Baguio, Banaue, and the Ilocos region. Baguio, with its weather, strawberries, and pine trees is popular for summer escapades and honeymoons. Banaue, in the mountains of the Cordilleras, is where the 2,000-year-old engineering marvel and UNESCO heritage site called Banaue Rice Terraces are found. The Olocos region is home to three UNESCO heritage sites, namely the historic city of Vigan with its turn-of-the-century Spanish-Mexican ambiance, and two Baroque churches of the Philippines, the Santa Maria and the Poai churches. Now going to central Philippines, we have the festive islands of Boracay, Cebu, Bohol, Puerto Galera, and Palawan. Boracay, with its powdery white sand, has been judged one of the finest beaches in the world. Lately, Boracay's popularity for weddings and honeymoons has earned it the added moniker of the romantic island among Asians. Cebu, an important historical and economic center, is where Spanish history in the Philippines began. The place is also known for its mangoes, beach resorts, and dive sites. The holes claim to fame are the chocolate hills, the tarsier monkeys, and the rich underwater marine life around the island. is the number one hub in the country for dive enthusiasts, and its white beach is popular for beach holidays. Balawan, considered an island paradise because of its pristine scenery, keeps two UNESCO heritage sites as part of its treasures. The Tubataha Reeves Natural Park and the Puerto Princesa Subterranean River National Park. The Subterranean River is also one of the new seven natural wonders of the world. 
Down in southern Philippines, we find Davao and Chargao. Davao, the gateway to Mindanao, is a charming city of exotic orchids, durian and banana plantations, colorful ethnic tribes, and the Philippine Eagle Sanctuary. Chargao Island is the surfing capital of the Philippines. These islands are easily combined into itineraries for product mixes like culture and history, nature and adventure, diving, health and wellness, shopping, leisure and entertainment, sun and beach, cruise, mice and events. Surveys of Condé Nast and travel and leisure publications for the world's best islands have always put Palawan, Boracay, and Cebu on the top 10 list for several years now. Being within the Coral Triangle, the Philippines is also well known to international divers as one of the top dive destinations in the world due to its rich marine biodiversity. about 2,000 species of fish and crustaceans, over 400 classes of corals, 25 shipwreck dive sites, and about 40,000 kilometers of coral reefs in the Philippines. The Philippines has 175 languages and dialects. However, English is one of the two official languages of the country, so visitors traveling from north to south will have no problem communicating with the local residents. So, add to the marvelous places, the cultural mix of the Philippines, the war. hospitality of the people, their innate love for fun, value for money, and affordability, and you have the cocktail that makes the Philippines the best destination for your clients for your next holiday. We hope to welcome you to the Philippines soon. Mabuhay! For more information, contact the nearest Philippine tourism office in your area. Thank you very much to the wonderful presentation from the Philippines and thank you to His Excellency and also to Darrell Adartes for uh, this beautiful uh, warm heart presentation. I would like to continue now with um, the presentation uh, from the cultural from the Mexican Cultural Institute and uh, uh, the director. Uh, Ixnik Iriwegas Peon has been the executive director of the Mexican Cultural Institute in Washington DC since March of 2020. She is a member of the National System of Art Creators, the Sistema Nacional de Creadores de Arte. A translator and cultural manager, she has professional work experience in the radio and television industry and the production of cultural and corporate events. As a translator, she began working for advertising agencies, law firms, museums, and non-governmental organizations. She has translated more than 30 books for the Fondo de Cultura Económica and other publishers. Ixniki Ruegas, welcome. Very nice to have you. We are ready for your presentation from the Mexican Cultural Institute. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. And um, on behalf of Ambassador Marta Barcena and all of us at the Mexican Embassy, we're very happy to be able to share with you some of our traditions. My colleague Monica Aro is going to help me sharing some images to accompany what I'm going to talk about. So Christmas, as you all know, is one of the most important religion, religious holidays of the Catholic Church and in that it commemorates the birth of Jesus Christ in Bethlehem. Mexico traces its Christmas traditions to colonial times. And the holiday season officially begins on December 12th with the Day of the Virgin of Guadalupe and ends on January the 6th with the Three Kings arrival. For some, it may stretch uh, to February the 2nd, the Dia de la Candelaria, where it is traditional to eat tamales. According to the Vatican, the Virgin of Guadalupe, dark haired and dark skinned, appeared in Mexico on December 12th, 1531, to an indigenous man baptized as Juan Diego. 
It was then that the Virgin asked Juan Diego to build a temple in her honor and climb to the top of the Tepeyac Hill, where he would find roses that were out of season, and that he should take them to the bishop as proof of her appearances. Upon reaching the bishop, Juan Diego was instructed by the Virgin to drop the flowers he was carrying on his cloak, and then the image of the Virgin of Guadalupe miraculously appeared on his cloak. It was then that this miracle from the Virgin would become a celebration. In 1667, thousands of pilgrims from Mexico and around the world gather in the Basilica of Guadalupe, the second most visited sanctuary dedicated to the Virgin Mary in the world, located on Tepeyac Hill. As is the case uh, of many Mexican traditions, syncretism is still present, and thus some pre-colonial traditions were hidden under the Catholic traditions. Although they seemed adept at the Catholic, Catholic religion, many indigenous people practiced a dual religion by hiding their gods and festivities behind other celebrations and images. An example of this is Tepeyac Hill, where it was said that the Virgin appeared, but it was also previously the place where the goddess Tonantzin, Mother Earth, was worshiped by the Aztecs. Starting on December 16, exactly nine days before Christmas Eve, is when the posadas begin. Posadas are a representation of the nine-day pilgrimage of Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem. In colonial Mexico, the Aztecs would celebrate the God of War, Huitzilopochtli, Huitzilopochtli's arrival in the month of Panquetzaltzili. The Aztecs would assemble in temples and wait for the winter solstice to pass. The tradition of posadas arose with the Spanish arrival, where they replaced the celebrations in honor of Huitzilopochtli. Typically, posadas are celebrated with family or between neighbors and friends. During the celebration, the participants make two groups. One group will represent Joseph and Mary, and the other, the owners of the dwellings. The pilgrims then leave with lighted candles and sing a litany outside of each house to be allowed inside. The last house will let them in, and the celebration begins. It is traditional to break colorful piñatas with seven spikes during posadas. The seven spikes represent the deadly sins, thus symbolizing victory over sin. Furthermore, biblical passages are staged where shepherds or the three kings follow the North Star to reach the, child, uh, the child's birth. Pastorelas, which is how these representations are called, are generally staged in schools, churches, or theaters, and those plays showcase God defeating, um, I mean, good defeating evil every time. The Eve of December 24th is Noche Buena, and that is uh, when we usually celebrate, we gather together with family and have a late dinner with our loved ones. This celebration of Jesus Christ's birth starts at the end of the last posada and ends with midnight mass, also called Misa de Gallo. During Christmas Eve, families get together and homes are decorated with wreaths of green leaves symbolizing hope, candles symbolizing the light of Jesus Christ illuminating the world, Nochebuena flowers, which are native to Mexico, and most recently, the Christmas tree. Another Christmas tradition is to have a nativity scene, like this one you see here. This is a very elaborate one. And the Christmas dinner includes pre-Hispanic foods such as michote, romeritos, and tamales, and other Spanish heritage foods such as bacalao, a la vizcaína, or pork loin, and sometimes even perky, turkey. We have ponche and uh, many other treats and sweets. On December 25th, families and friends get together for what we call recalentado, which literally means reheating. So what we do is eat the leftovers from the night before and get together in a more informal gathering with family and friends. The next Christmas tradition takes place on early January, that's on January 6th, and it is the celebration of the Three Kings. This tradition celebrates the visit of the wise man from the East to Jesus after his birth. It is believed that they, there were three characters who were guided by a star and they came to Bethlehem to give gifts to the son of God. Some Mexican children get their presents from Santa, but it is more traditional to get them from the three wise men after leaving a shoe next to the nativity scene. During this celebration, the Rosca de Reyes is eaten a tradition inherited from Spain. 
Hidden inside the Rosca de Reyes, there is a figurine formerly made of porcelain, nowadays most commonly made of plastic, and it's called El Niño, and it represents baby Jesus. Tradition dictates that whoever finds the figure inside their slice of Rosca becomes godfather or godmother of the child and will have to organize the Candelaria celebration and make tamales. Candelaria Day is on February 2nd, as we said before, and is the last tradition of the Christmas season. This day commemorates the presentation of Jesus to the temple, and the date is close to the day of the birth of the sun in the Aztec calendar. The Aztecs perform rituals in honor of their gods with products made from corn, and both celebrations merged to give rise to the Candelaria celebration as we know it today. At the Dia de la Candelaria celebration, Baby Jesus' godparents will lift him from the nativity scene they set up on December 24th to dress him and present him to the church. The cloth used to dress him is known as ropon and can be sewn by hand and adorned with embroidery. The most used ropones are those which represent saints, Hebrew shepherds, or angels. After the child's presentation to the temple, the celebration begins where tamales and atole are eaten. And so the Christmas celebrations in Mexico are concluded till the next uh, December. Um, my colleague Monica Aro is going to share with you on the chat at this webinar a link to a Spotify playlist with Christmas traditional Mexican Christmas carols that I hope you enjoy. And uh, we're going to invite you now to see a video that is not uh, exclusively about Christmas, but about the colors, textures, and traditions that uh, surround our daily lives in Mexico. Monica, please.
Thank you so much to Ixnik Hiriwaigas Peon and Monica Haro Goidia from the Mexican Cultural Institute for this amazing, very, very beautiful uh, uh, presentation. We are going to continue now with the Embassy of the Slovak Republic and uh, Teresia Filipeyova, who is the Cultural and Public Diplomacy Counselor of the Embassy of the Slovak Republic. Teresia has been at the Embassy of uh, the Slovak Republic in Washington, D.C. And uh, she started her career in uh, 2011 uh, that she has been working at the Ministry of Foreign and European Affairs of the Slovak Republic. In September 2017, she was posted to Washington, D.C. And during her posting here in 2018, she has participated in the high-level visit of the Slovak president, Andrzej Kiska, in Chicago, and in 2019, the visit of the Slovak Prime Minister, Peter Pellegrini, in a meeting with the President Donald Trump. She mainly enjoys her work because of tremendous opportunities to meet like-minded professionals. What really makes her happy is that she can introduce talented Slovaks to potential partnership between US and Slovakia. For instance, at the end of January 2020, she took a huge part on organizing a very prestigious and successful concert, Slovaks at the Carnegie in New York City. Please welcome Teresia Filipeyova and uh, the Embassy of the Slovak Republic with their presentation. Thank you, Joanna. Dear ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Slovak Embassy in Washington, D.C., let me highlight some interesting facts about Slovak Christmas traditions. Slovakia is a country of fascinating traditions. Firstly, our Christmas season starts with Advent, a period of four Sundays and weeks before Christmas. As a matter of fact, we just had our first Advent Sunday last Sunday. It is also time of cleaning, baking, shopping for presents and decorating the Christmas tree. We begin the festivities on the 24th and the finish of the 26th of December. In general, the Christmas tree is decorated the weekend before or the day before Christmas Eve. The Christmas supper has a lot of courses, including a soup, a fish dish, potato salad with mayonnaise. However, I would like to emphasize that type of soup varies depends on region or on family, such as sauerkraut, lentil, fish, or milky mushroom soup. Every family has its own secret recipe. And for example, my family always has milky mushroom soup, and we eat this soup only for Christmas. Additionally, we follow the Christmas Christian rule, not meat, all day. A common tradition is the children leave the room when the baby Jesus comes with the present, no Santa. When the gifts are placed under the Christmas tree, someone rings the bell. That's the clue for the children. Majority of Slovak families open their presents after the dinner. Many people attend the midnight mass, which is the busiest uh, church service of the year. Secondly, the December 25th, and, uh, which is the Christmas day, and the next December 26th is the San Stefan's day. During these days, we enjoy the leftovers, watch Christmas fairy tales, visit our families and friends, come together and wish each other Merry Christmas, Vesele Vianoce in Slovak language. Thirdly, Christmas tree are kept until the January the 6th, the Feast of Three Kings Epiphany, similar as here in the United States of America. Finally, let me present the video about the Christmas tradition in Slovakia. And I would like to highlight the first photo in video that is famous Christmas market used to take place at the main square at Hvietoslavo Square in the capital city of Slovakia. Additionally, uh, you will listen to the Christmas carols played by the Slovak famous violinist Peter Kiral, who found the New York Virtuosi a string ensemble. In the second video, uh, you will discover Slovakia from the different aspects, such as historical, cultural, but also free times activity. We're going to continue with the presentation from the Holy Land, because what is Christmas without somebody coming from the Holy Land? I would like to present to you Dr. Amal Khal Khalil David, a native of the Holy Land, who is a director and outreach uh, at, uh, for outreach at the Arab American and co-founder of and a board member of the Arab American Foundation. She was born and raised in Nazareth, but she has been a frequent visitor to the Sea of Galilee, Bethlehem and Jerusalem. 
She earned her PhD in communication with an emphasis in multicultural education and has over 35 years of experience as a supervisor of bilingual education in Detroit public schools. And as an adjunct college professor uh, in, uh, also in Detroit. Additionally, she has been a producer and a host of several radio programs in Detroit. Uh, Dr. Amal Khalil David, welcome and thank you for coming to give us your presentation. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm very excited and I am really enjoying these presentations. They are amazing. They, it's just what it tells me that we are so much the same, more than different. We are one, whether we come from Philippines or Slovakia or Czech Republic, or Mexico, we are the same people. We have the lo love for tradition, for religion, for family. And the uh, family and religion are big in our uh, uh, tradition and during Christmas. But I want to, uh, this is a picture with me actually helping is my colleague, uh, uh, Sophia uh, Siegel. Thank you so much, but this is my city. And this is the church that was built above the uh, place where uh, the cave actually where uh, uh, the angel um, Gabriel appeared to uh, Mary and told her that you are going to have a baby named uh, Jesus. But this is the church. Actually, we, we, I, I grew up very, very close in, in this neighborhood. Uh, so Nazareth is uh, very congested and it's built on a hill, up a hill. So uh, when we stood really on, uh, on our balcony, we saw all Nazareth somehow. It was beautiful. But uh, yeah, Sophia, please uh, go to the one. Uh, this is actually, I want to tell you when I grew up, there was no church built above the cave where the, uh, the uh, annunciation happened. Um, so uh, this is uh, the, I was very, it was very easy during my school time to go down to the cave and visit exactly where was bo uh, Jesus was born and exactly where uh, Virgin Mary lived. And the, I have many, many pictures uh, of these caves. Actually, this is the school that was built uh, above the, uh, the caves. And they saw uh, the nuns even didn't know that uh, we were missed during lunch hour to go to play on the ground. And it was complete darkness, but we found our way and we visited the very often the place where Jesus was uh, or uh, the Annunciation where Mary was uh, told that she's going to have a baby uh, uh, whose name will be Jesus. And the, the quarters were under this church where uh, 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 Mary lived. And this is actually me. And uh, this is Mary's well. Many times we hanged out in front of, of this well where Mary got her water. There is another well, it's, uh, this well, this is a better picture of this well, but I, I looked up uh, to see it uh, from a church, a Orthodox church that was built above this well, also where Mary, Virgin Mary, got her water. Uh, I think from, in, on Christmas, I think we have, uh, we celebrate the uh, uh, in the square of the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church. Uh, Sophia, you can show now if you wish. This is the Orthodox Church that was built above Mary's well. And this is a huge uh, Christmas tree. And uh, in front of this church, we do a lot of celebrations uh, for Christmas. And uh, from, uh, from Nazareth, uh, I want to tell you, you all read the story about Joseph and Mary traveling to this city, which called the city of David. My last name is David. Maybe this is what's built uh, after me or named after me, Amal David. And by the way, Amal is uh, the, the meaning of Amal is hope. So this is the message of our Christmas, Amal means hope. But this is uh, Bethlehem and the, the reason Mary and Joseph left Nazareth is because Joseph 
was born in Jeru or, uh, originally from uh, Bethlehem and Joseph uh, went for the senses and they of course rode the, the, uh, the, uh, the donkey for three days to arrive Bethlehem so he can uh, register. And at, in those days, uh, Virgin Mary didn't know that that was her due date. And uh, I want to tell you one more thing. My grandmother told me, and that was, uh, she was uh, in early 1900. Uh, she was growing up in 1900. And guess what? When she wanted to visit Bethlehem, she rode the, she took the same path on the donkey to go to visit the birthplace of Jesus Christ. Uh, this time I did leave Nazareth and I went to visit Bethlehem. Uh, Sophia, uh, this is the, uh, the, the square where many celebrations happen. And this is uh, outside of the church that was built on the nativity scene. It's called the nativity church. Uh, if you can go inside, this is this is the door. I was shocked. I asked the priest, why the door is such uh, small? He said maybe during wars, it is slowed down, the, the horses coming in, or maybe thieves, or, or maybe this is, was the style of all homes then. Even I saw my great grandparents home and it was also a small door or maybe it was less expensive, uh, but uh, our uh, motif then was small doors. And sh show them Sophia uh, inside. This is when I kneeled and prayed uh, at the spot where Jesus was born. And this was very, very special. Although I was born and raised and visited many times in my youth, but at old age, which is last, last year in February, I was, uh, very moved by the spirit of, uh, of uh, uh, the Holy Land and uh, the coming of Jesus Christ. Uh, and uh, it was a memorable moment. From, from Bethlehem, Jesus, uh, uh, Mary, Joseph, and Jesus went back to Nazareth and uh, stayed in Nazareth uh, until his youth and act actually he he was baptized in the Jordan River Sophia if you can show the the uh, this is uh, this is the Jordan River uh, and uh, that's me visiting it recently uh, I took it for granted when I was a small in fact when I attended school I took it really for granted I didn't know where I was exactly, I thought this is the world, that's it. This is the Holy Land. There is no world uh, other than that. And when we misbehaved in school, I remember nuns telling us, girls, uh, you, are, uh, you should be blessed because, and you should behave because you are the descendants of uh, the Virgin Mary. But uh, this is where uh, Jesus was baptized by uh, Johanna, uh, which is John. And it says here in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan River. So from there, this is another view of it, but from there, uh, we go to Jerusalem, and this is a very holy city and very disputed city. And it has been disputed not only now throughout the history. Uh, it's an amazing, uh, uh, beautiful uh, city where uh, Jesus Christ spent uh, his uh, adulthood. Uh, this is uh, the square where uh, celebrations and Christmases and all that happen. Uh, this is the yard before I went into the, ch the sepulcher church. If you want to focus on a couple of scenes, uh, Sophia inside, this is uh, me praying, right? By the way, this is exactly the spot, exactly the spot where the crucifixion crucifixion happened because I had we had to take stairs over uh, many 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 steps and maybe some of you have been there and you know what I mean I mean you see me here alone but uh, we were in line for many hours especially in the summer and the during holidays but uh, I encourage all of you to see this part of the world because it is a spectacular it's a just a, a, it's a, it's amazing uh, feeling and the fulfillment you receive 
uh, from there. I want to tell you that so many tourists, so many pilgrims, especially from Philippines and Mexico and the rest of Europe and America, they visit this is part of, uh, of Earth, uh, which is very special. Um, any other pictures? Uh, this is uh, the nativity. This is a Christmas uh, actually uh, in Bethlehem, outside of Bethlehem. The, the, uh, the, by the way, this is not typical. It's in you where uh, Santa distributes gifts uh, traveling by camel. Uh, camel, I know there is a stereotype that we ride camel all the time, but the, I haven't seen camel. I didn't see all my life a camel until I came to the United States. But this is to revive the culture of camels roaming around then. Uh, so uh, this is a festive way. I do, uh, this is another festive way in Bethlehem and uh, more of Nazareth, but I do want to take a few more minutes to tell you exactly how we celebrate a Christmas. And it is so much similar to many of you who explained what is a Christmas about. Uh, we actually light up candles every Sunday for four Sundays, one candle for four Sundays before Christmas. What we do a lot is uh, shopping for before Christmas, about three weeks before Christmas, we shop for new clothes for children. Remember, only for children. The children have to have a new clothes for church Christmas day. We do a lot of cleaning. We open windows, we open doors. We, uh, we empty every room in the house. We clean it from top to bottom. We dust everything. And then we, um, uh, we uh, uh, clean every corner of our home. We have the uh, real trees. Uh, we decorate these trees. Uh, and uh, we concentrate more than fresh uh, real trees. We concentrate a lot on nativity displays. I remember doing a nativity scene for half of our room, half of our family room was the nativity display. We do a, a lot of the Christmas bazaars and we do on the streets, we barbecue a chestnuts. And of course, decorated the streets and lighted the streets to make our tourists very happy, very comfortable, very festive. Uh, so this is all leading to Christmas evening. Christmas evening, we have parades. We walk from one church to another. We hear carols and we attend masses in different churches. And then we go to centers and we see plays, we, see, we hear carols, and the center distributes uh, uh, gifts and candy. Uh, scouts, uh, the scouts are different than the, and then the United States. They roam the streets in the Holy Lands and they play the tobel, tobel, it means the drums. Uh, people sing. I remember walking down the streets of Nazareth and singing with a tourist I have never met from Europe and America. We really uh, wanted, the, we are very hospitable people and we uh, do treat our uh, guests in town, uh, especially on Christmas very well. I want to tell you that Christmas day, if four things we do special. Uh, we, uh, we make our home the most beautiful, it's like a bride. We make it look so pretty and we put in new uh, fresh uh, covers for our tables and uh, uh, just make it as festive and play uh, carols and uh, we attend the church service. We have open house, so cousins and the uncles uh, come to our home and we go to their homes and we stay only 10 minutes. We drink little liqueur with a piece of baklava or a chocolate and gifts only given. Can you turn that down? And we also, we have, uh, we pass on the gifts to uh, our children. And the, the last thing we do Christmas day is we have big meals with our elders and uh, we have a lot of delicious uh, food, uh, kibbe, mm -hmm. pasta, uh, but we have to have lamb, lamb meat. It's in fact, my grandparents used to slaughter a lamb and stuff it with holiday rice. Uh, I, uh, the last thing, uh, and of course, every time we see people, we say Eid Sa'id. It means happy Christmas day, Eid Majid. 
and the uh, our uh, celebrations uh, go on for the month of uh, of the January uh, because more family visits to each home. We have more family visits. Uh, we uh, we also celebrate together with the Orthodox uh, people, neighbors, family members that Orthodox that they celebrate a uh, Christmas on this on January seventh, and two weeks after we celebrate the Christmas with our Armenian friends, many Armenians, um, because of their danger in their homeland uh, in the 1900s, they moved to our lands, Syria, Lebanon, Palestine. Uh, they moved there a long time ago in the 20s, 30s, and 40s and, and established home uh, with us. And that's why we celebrate Armenian holiday with them. And uh, you see this screen, uh, it's uh, in the Holy Land. If you don't see a, an olive tree, it means you haven't seen uh, uh, the Holy Land. It's, it's it, it, every family prides itself of having uh, at least one uh, olive tree or many olive trees. And uh, I, I like to take three minutes, please, to show a, a very nice uh, video. And we are going to focus on the city of David, Bethlehem, the birthplace of Jesus Christ. Uh, Sophia, please uh, roll the video. The city of Bethlehem is an ancient Palestinian town located in the central West Bank, south of the capital of Jerusalem. Bethlehem is the hub of the Palestinian culture, and notably the biblical birthplace of Jesus Christ. As a result, Bethlehem is home of one of the oldest Christian communities in the world. Bethlehem is a famous tourist destination, specifically for Christians who come from all over the world to perform pilgrimage and worship. Bethlehem is known for the olive wood carvings that the locals make from the olive groves growing in the Mediterranean climate. Bethlehem is mentioned in the Amarna letters as early as 1400 BC. At the time, the king of Jerusalem asked the king of Egypt for help in regaining control of Bethlehem. Bethlehem was a major town of the Canaanite civilization, of which it got its name from. The indigenous people of the Canaanites were the first people ever to live in Palestine. Bethlehem is holy because it is the birthplace of Jesus Christ and is marked by an inlaid silver star in a grotto under the 6th century Church of the Nativity, which shares Manger Square with the 15th century Church of St. Catherine and the 1860 Mosque of Omar. The city has a long pre-Egyptian and pre-Roman history prescribed first in the 14th century BC in the letters of Amarna. Archaeological evidence from the Chalcolithic period or the Bronze Age shows that the first human presence was on the eastern slope of the central hill of the city and in the middle of the fields of Beit Zahur. The importance of Bethlehem is not only manifested through its religious significance, but also in the tourism sector, as well as its handicrafts and its derived products, such as those made from olive wood, souvenirs, and hand embroidery sold to tourists visiting the city. Furthermore, Bethlehem is also known for the mother of all pearls, marble and metal industries, which are the main source of income for the Palestinian people of Bethlehem. The Palestinian village of al Roshayde is within the proximity of Bethlehem where Palestinian nomads live, also known as Bedouins in Arabic. The Bedouins of this village are living similarly to the European Amish community living in Pennsylvania, where they rely on nature in its purest form, rather than depending on the technology way of life. El Roshayde community is known for their warm, kind-hearted, and hospitable mannerisms. From this village, you can see the Dead Sea and can experience a great desert safari. Tourists visiting Al Roshayde will enjoy a natural, primitive way of life where the Palestinian tribe continue to ride camels and horses and live in tents till present day. The environment of the village is desert-like, where the sun is hot and bright, 
The sand is golden and the visibility is unmeasured. There are numerous important historical and religious monuments of the city of Bethlehem. The most famous of them are the Church of the Nativity, referred to in Arabic as Kanisat al Mahd, where Jesus was born. Thank you very, very much to Dr. Amal Cahill David and Sophia Segal for presenting uh, the traditions of the Holy Land to us today. This was lovely. Uh, I would like to bring back uh, Teresia Filipeyova from uh, the Cultural and Public Diplomacy section of the Embassy of the Slovak Republic. Teresia?
Czechoslovakia. Uh, best friends forever. As the Philippines uh, start celebrating Christmas so early on, uh, what is the reason that this happened in Philippines that uh, the season starts many, many months before Christmas? Well, thank you for the question. Um, I think it's because of the bear months. So September is the first month that ends um, with bear. So September, October, November, December. So that's the common explanation. So it's a license for us to start the, uh, the holiday parties um, once the bear months um, commence. So that's why we have the longest Christmas celebration, I think, in the world, around seven to five months of the Tide celebration. Does usually the market do pretty well? I mean, do you see an uptick in the economy because of the long Christmas, um, you know, happy spirit? Well, definitely. Um, in fact, um, during this pandemic time, um, most economists and analysts in the Philippines are looking to you know, have looked to, to the holiday spending of uh, Filipino consumers. As you know, um, so demand for food, the demand for gifts. Um, and I just read an interesting um, headline today. It says that the COVID has forced Filipinos to think the unthinkable. So what's this unthinkable? not having Christmas parties in person. So this is a very, uh, cult it's, uh, it's divergent from our usual tradition. So just imagine having parties um, starting in September, then going through the Christmas season uh, to December. There's a lot of parties that we have to do virtually now. So, but yes, um, so the holiday season is uh, very much a boost to the Philippine economy. Very nice. Uh, I have received another question uh, for the Czech Republic. Uh, why do you think the tradition for fish uh, started as compared to people eating meat as the main dish for Christmas um, around the world? Mm. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, well, with the, with the fish tradition, it's uh, really hard to say because as you saw in the video and in our ambassador's remarks too, uh, we eat both carp fish and then some people who don't prefer to eat carp fish, they, they have schnitzel. So I think it's, it's very interesting with the carp fish. I, I will be honest, I don't know why we started to eat carp fish, but it's purely connected with Christmas. And it's very interesting because I can share a story from my personal experience. We have a little pond nearby our house and there is no reason for me why not to enjoy the carp, you know, throughout the year. But many people, they don't eat carp until the Christmas day. And then entire Czech Republic has a carp for that, you know, particular date. But it's actually very specific and to me very tasty kind of fish. And I have it, you know, throughout the year. But in Czech Republic, uh, no one else orders carp, you know, apart from the Christmas day, which is very interesting. It's an old tradition. Uh, it comes, I would say, from... 16th or 17th century. But why we eat fish, uh, it's hard to say, but I'm very happy that we do it because it's delicious. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I have a, a question for Mexico. Um, people are asking why th there is an impression that the native people uh, mostly celebrate um, the Mother Virgin as compared to the Christ, even around the Christmas season. Is that uh, true with the native people in Mexico or, you know, not? Uh, you have to unmute yourself, please. I, um, I don't know if mainly, um, but certainly just as importantly, uh, the Virgin um, of Guadalupe is a very important symbol. Um, it's been said that every Mexican is uh, Guadalupano, uh, regardless of, of their religion. And uh, it is a, an important symbol. But of course, during Christmas, what it's being celebrated is the birth of Jesus Christ. And uh, that is represented by mainly through the nativity scenes that don't have the baby on it until uh, December 24th, where you uh, lay it down to sleep, and then uh, you take it to the temple on February on very traditional families. Most families take it out before before then. But um, yes, we are uh, both uh, celebrating Jesus and his mother. 
Thank you very much. And, and um, the big performance that happens for uh, the Madonna de Guadalupe are taking place when exactly? December the 12th. 12th, okay. That's yes, right. the people start uh, walking towards the Basilica earlier on, and you can see them coming in, in trucks and, uh, um, and bicycles and some walk from their points of origin, and they start several days before that, but the actual day is... Uh, December the 12th. Great, thank you very much. Um, I have received a question for the Holy Land. Um, people are asking if you celebrate um, uh, Ep Epiphany, you know, in uh, January 6th, and if there is a lot of um, uh, a lot of celebrations around the Jordan River um, for the for that specific celebration where uh, Christ was baptized and uh, the Holy Spirit was above him and all this background story. Uh, you have to unmute yourself. We haven't heard anything yet. <laughs> yes, uh, this holiday is uh, celebrated big time. They are, it's taken very, very seriously. It's celebrated throughout the Holy Lands, especially at the, at the uh, right at the Jordan River. So all churches, they, they gather and celebrate. And at homes, we have a special sweets, actually, like uh, we, we uh, uh, fry some specific sweets and the uh, and uh, some sweets dipped in uh, special syrup. It's, it's like uh, Jesus was uh, uh, baptized, like dipped, the, the idea of dipped. So we, it, it actually, it's a lot of fun that, and we, we do many special uh, sweets around that time. Do, do people do a pilgrimage towards the Jordan River yes. in specific areas and yes. because the Baptist? The, around the Jordan River, it's very much built up. Uh, there is a space, a huge space left for special celebrations. And what's nice about these celebrations, we have every major sect of the Christianity there, whether it is Coptic, which is a, a like type of Orthodox, it comes from Egypt, whether it is Chaldeans from Iraq represented there, whether it is Maronites, they come from Lebanon, uh, whether it is Armenians, uh, it is just I have goosebumps as I am talking because it is, you see them working together, all priests, all people. We don't have any sex at that uh, uh, moment. No. Of, of our I, know, I know in Greece, people go to the seawater and uh, there is a ceremony where the priest will uh, drop a, a, cro a cross. And then there will be people diving in the freezing water of uh, the Aegean uh, to recover the cross. And whoever ends up uh, getting it is the blessed person for the year. So people really compete uh, to get the cross and get the blessing for the year. Yes, and I want to just to add, there are people from all over the world, they come to be, get baptized oh. as right in the river on that day. Oh, they come wow. as part of the ceremony. They come to get baptized. It's a, they feel it is a historic. It's a, they needed that in their life. And they, so the moment is remembered throughout the year, especially on that day. Wonderful. Wow. So especially on that day, they come to get baptized. Yeah. Yes. And I have received also a question for the Slovak Republic. Uh, people uh, saw all the beautiful scenery uh, for touristic aspects, and they are wondering, uh, usually people come as tourists during the Christmas time and the New Year's, mostly for the ski resorts or mostly to really celebrate Christmas and uh, visit the different markets and uh, get to know the traditions of uh, the Slovak Republic. What is your feeling? Do people spend mostly time in ski resorts or actually celebrating with the rest of the people? Uh, it depends, uh, of course, on the age, but of course, they they really enjoy the Christmas traditions and the Christmas market because they want to compare and try our traditional food. But also the, some of them, especially younger, they prefer to spend time in the ski resorts, which are very famous. So 
that's my opinion. Thank you. Very, very nice. Uh, thank you very much to everybody, uh, Czech Republic, the Philippines, Mexico, the Slovak Republic and the Holy Land uh, for showing us all uh, the traditions that uh, you have during this beautiful uh, holiday season. Uh, I would like to thank uh, all our attendees, all our technical support from all the various embassies and entities. And I would like to close the program by introducing again Sila Suice so that she can uh, give you her wishes. Sila. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. I, I, we are most grateful to all our speakers for that enlightening presentation. Thank you for joining us. And I would like to take this opportunity to invite you for the next program in January 26. It's our ambassador speaker series. And we're going to host the ambassador, uh, Her Excellency Roya uh, Rahami from the, for the embassy of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. Please register and join us. It's going to be a very interesting program. And also I would like to wish you that this holiday season brings you a renewed hope, faith, and many blessings in the new year. Happy, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Holidays, whatever you, you celebrate. Have a wonderful new year. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye. Thank you everybody. Merry Christmas. Enjoy. Merry Christmas, you, Happy yes. New Year. And, Merry uh, Christmas. Happy, Merry Christmas to everybody. Hello, Christo. Thank you. Bye -bye.